I'm John Hobson, and uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out to Hello Project Gallery for the first installment of Real Talk. Um, I feel it's a series, I, I, I want to start a series of talks where um, people can come and have real conversations that are actually critical, um, like actually start some critical discourse in the city. I think that it's something that's important to our community, and I feel like it's something that's seriously lacking in our community. So here's number one, um, real talk, photography is content, and we brought together a panel of four artists. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll start with Michael Bies, um, good friend, um, excellent drawer. Yeah. Um, he works from uh, photographs a lot of times, uh, and I thought he was a perfect panelist for this talk. Emily Peacock, whose exhibition you're in the middle of. Um, really proud of this show, and uh, really proud of the work that she put into this. Sebastian Bonsi, who I'm least familiar with, but uh, an excellent street photographer. Uh, and then Vinod Hobson, who works at uh, PhotoFest here in town. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you all for coming and for being here. Um, I guess I'll start it off by saying that, like, for the last like probably five years or so, I've been really interested in photography, like a photograph as an object, and basically sort of like the history of like photography and everyday, like everyday photography. So I, I really am interested in like the photographs that people have on their refrigerators or on their dashboards, how photographs are displayed. So in my work the last few years, and so this show and like the Lawndale residency, I was really sort of focusing on like the, the photograph as an object and sort of how it's changed um, and how we view it over the over basically the entire history of photography. So, and I guess like to to an example of that is basically the teeth image in the back. So that's like that is the first photograph that was ever taken of me. And it was like literally taken hours after I was like taken my first breath, and it's like that's that to me that's interesting that like the minute we're born our photograph is taken like literally an hour after we are born. So. I think it's I think it's interesting that you're talking about photography and sort of its ubiquity because it is. Right now. But you're referencing um, in a lot of this work, in all of this work, probably with the exception of the photos of your father. Um, a time when we were still on a cusp, like before this, mm -hmm. right? Like this, it's, I don't know, I mean, looking around this room also, like this is something that is very peculiar to sort of our generation, maybe. Like maybe actually I'm going to talk about Michael's past anymore, maybe, because you might be slightly younger. But this notion of sort of the, the drugstore four by six, um, you know, had a relatively like small period of time, I think, even in the history of photography, um, where it was actually that accessible. I mean, anybody sort of younger than us, right. who are digital natives, don't experience photographs in this way at all. Right. Well, I, I was thinking about too that like I'm very lucky like to have like all these albums to go through. I don't think people really make photo albums anymore. They may like get a book published online or something like that but to like have it where it's like the actual physical photograph and my mom made like so many of them was and then it sort of stops at a certain point too like she she sort of stopped making them at a certain point too going towards like a more digital you know not being able to get prints at CVS or whatever you know. so how did she manage the photos? how did she manage the photos? well like did she take photos and print them out digitally or did she yeah no <laughs> no it was like she brought them to Walgreens or Walmart from like the phone, the digital camera? No, like, yeah, from, well, for a long time, like, she shot with a Canon AE-1, so 35 millimeter, and then after that, um, a lot of disposable cameras, and then finally a digital camera. Yeah. I think the thing that the note is talking about is part of something much larger, and I've thought about this before, like, our generation, probably roughly, is the last generation that remembers not having a computer. Right. right, like not having a computer at all. And I think it's easy to kind of like plow right over that 
fact, but if you stop and realize that people of our age are the last generation to be in that moment before the computer. And I think that the computer is what changed the nature of photography, For obviously. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's just a really kind of momentous moment, actually. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, in my studio, it's all about those photographs. It's all about those little remnants of childhood. And I don't know what kids, what people younger than us, <coughs> I don't know how they'll navigate sort of their family history because, I mean, for me, everything is built out of family history. And the most accessible thing I have are the, you know, the paper photographs. And the, you know, photographs. So I think it's going to be a very different experience for you know, people who are younger than us, how they re-piece their childhood together. Because yeah. I know every day I'm re-piecing my childhood. You know, I don't even know if people who take, you know, images on on their phones, for that matter, how often they actually go back and look at them. I mean, they're obviously all, they're somewhere, right? They're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're on their computer hard drives or their memory cards. But, they kind of you know, how often do they look at them? They don't. They oh. take them and they sort of, they shuttle them away. Uh, I'm around the, the, the young folk. You know, because, because I teach them. And, and they do go back. They do go back. And I got to say, I teach photographers, so, you know, maybe that's a specialized group. But, but they do certainly make a difference between the stuff that they take for their work and then the stuff that's just like the everyday, like Instagram uh, type of stuff. And yeah, stuff does come back in, in weird ways. But, I don't know, I, I think at some point there's gonna be like, there's gonna be a craving for the object again. Mm -hmm. Because uh, one of the little things that I do uh, with my appreciation classes, I have them bring like objects from home when we're discussing different subjects. And the objects from home are like really piss poor. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like well, bring me an emblem of belonging, like something that, that, you, that you own for belonging or excelling in a certain group. You know, so, so they'll bring trophies and, and you know, pens and buttons. And that stuff is ugly. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like shitty made. And it's, uh, it, it's no, I think there's going to be a thirst for it. Just like, just like people were ready when that new Challenger came out. Yeah. They were like, this. I want to drive this. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know. I think it's not just a question of the photograph. It's it's everything. All of our stuff is shitty. Our clothes are shitty. Our cars are shitty. Or just we have shitty stuff. <laughs> it's very ugly. And and uh, I don't. Know. Well, I think People that probably things. is already happening. I mean, that that's the, happen ri that's the rise of this, like you know, the artistical movement about everything. Yeah. Like you know, because you do, you sort of you, there is a at least a, a romantic notion of. of the object, the handmade something within. I think though, like when we start talking, in, or I'm uncomfortable when we start speaking in generalities like this, because I know myself when I start thinking, generally there's always something to break that down, right? So I think that being in the context of this show, with this work here, and thinking about the photograph as object, I always try, or I try more and more, I'm you know, not successful most of the time, but I try to relate thoughts I have about particular things, like the photo as an object, how is it manifested in this show? Not, you know, in some sort of general sense, you know, because I, it starts to fall apart for me, I think, generally. And I think in this show, it's really interesting because the fact that these objects are, or that these photographs are really objects, and with the exception of this one, they're not framed. The traditional role of the photograph, or at least these kind of snapshots, is to pull you in to a space you remember, sort of act as a catalyst to kind of remember something. And then these photographs are disrupted in all kinds of ways. There's objects put on top of the photographs, but the thing that I find really interesting is I don't really read those objects on top of the photographs as terribly three-dimensional <coughs> because they're compressed again in this object that's on the wall. When I look at them, like the teeth on the baby's face, I have trouble separating the photo from the teeth because they're all sort of in this flat plane, right? And so when I look at them, I don't immediately see a photograph with three-dimensional objects on top of a photograph. 
I see just an image that presents itself. And I think the fact that they're unframed and that they're printed on aluminum, and they are really object-like, they kind of repel you at the surface. I think for me, that's what sort of makes these interesting as objects in the specific content of what you're doing. Yeah. At least that's how I see them. I read a review where someone said they wanted to kind of go up and touch them yeah. as if as if this object on the surface was sort of three-dimensional, and I think, I don't think that at all. I think the, I think it looks very compressed. I think that's true for most of them, with the exception of maybe the jello one, which does have some more depth. And I do think that they invite, <coughs> they invite the touch, but not because of the, I agree with you, not because of the dimensionality of the thing that's on them. I think that they invite the touch, for me, because they mimic this, they mimic that photograph, that object that you're so used to touching. And I think it being without the frame and and the scale maybe something too. And I know that that sort of sounds like I'm contradicting myself. That, but there is, there is something about there's something very tactile about it. I think. Yeah, I mean, so they're printed, they mounted on aluminum, but they also have a laminate, so it's like a very matte finish. So there's no sort of glare. Um, and the mount is super thin, uh, so like I'm taking those. Th those are like decisions I'm making to, to make it feel like it, the actual object itself. You know, it's like a matte finish and um, really thin, and then the rounded corners as well. What do you think about this work, Sebastian? I'm about it. Obviously, <laughs> you know. I made it through two loops to be here. Um, I can't help but think about about all the work, uh, you know, all the way that you've made in the last like two or three years. Mm -hmm. It's it's really fascinating to me to to sort of like jump with you, mm -hmm. you know, because it's on some level. I think on a very surface level, it seems like to work with a different artist each time out. You know? Really? I, I feel that way. Um, you know, going from, uh, you know, your food series to, to your uh, theater stuff to this. Um, you know, I think after a bit of consideration, it, it's quite obvious that, you know, it's like one of those things that keeps popping up is that relationship with objects, but it's not always the same. So for example, in your food series, like the photographs themselves don't have this sort of objectness that these do. Yeah. But that sort of direct relationship with these these foods as objects, as sort of like sculptural elements. But again, kind of flatten out mm -hmm. and maybe this other reference like painting. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's it's sort of these different dynamics, but around these similar subjects. And I don't know that I've made up my mind yet about what is so fascinating about this one <coughs> for me outside of, you know, outside of the continuum. Yeah. Just because I had to think about, you know, all of Peacock's work. I mean, I think it's a disruptive break, you know, because the event, your mother's death, that prompted all this, is not something that anybody ever plans for, and it's not something, you know, that is in the continuum. Um, you know, Emily and I have talked a little bit because my dad died uh, when I was an undergrad, and when you're an artist and something like this happens, you either you either respond to it through your work, or you, know, or you don't respond to it through your work. And I think that there are plenty of artists who don't respond to these kinds of things through their work in any obvious way. But I know for myself when it happened, I dealt with it in the work. And so looking at this, I think the most important thing about this show is not really, you know, some of the more analytical discussions of object or anything like that. I think the most important thing about this show is that this is a record of a person dealing with the death of a parent in these art books. And I think that that's something easy to kind of um, understate but it's a really, really big deal. And so I think that's why there's a break here. And I think that it could be the case that the work never looks the same. You know? I mean, that could be the case. You know? These kinds of things that occur in life outside of kind of the context of art always seem to me to be 
the things have just changed a little completely sometimes. Yeah, and I, I mean, I felt like I was working differently too, like in the studio. Like it was just like, I felt a lot more freedom to make anything that I wanted to make. Um, it was just about sort of being in there, making making stuff. And then, you know, later working on figuring out what went together. But it was just about having one day a week, basically, where I would stay in the studio and make stuff. So was there a lot of work that was, or other work, that was sort of unlike this work? Yeah, yeah. ended yeah. up going someplace else? Yeah, or not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah there's, there's a, there was like these, there was a, yeah, there was a lot of stuff I won't really go into detail. But, yeah. but completely different kinds of things. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like but, really grotesque, like medical slides and stuff like that. Yeah. So what brought you to weed these out versus, or to show these versus some of others? <coughs> I guess, I mean, working a lot with Jonathan, talking about what sort of made sense, and also, you know, it, this was, the, I was making stuff that had nothing to do, I mean, it has to do with my mom, but it, had, it was like, I wasn't using any part of my family's, like, photographs or anything, and so, it just sort of made sense to, to use the photographs as, like, a continuation of my work. Yeah. I was going to ask, do, do you... Looking back on it now, and, and maybe in the context of Michael's question and Sebastian's comments, do you think of it as this sort of evolution, which is how I saw a lot of your work prior to this? I could sort of see, because you could see some of the, the concerns sort of progressing. Um, do you see this as an evolution, or do you think it will be outside of the timeline? I mean, obviously, this is maybe too early for you to say that. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't. So I like, made all this work while, while my mother was ill and taking care of her. So, it, I mean, I. I wasn't really thinking a lot about it, I was just making stuff, but I don't feel like it is a continuation because I worked with my mother and my family so much, mm -hmm. they were like complete collaborators with my work and in my work, and so like that has changed. I don't even know what, you know, what artwork I'll be making next, you know. I think that shows in these, I mean, it may, ju may just be me, but when I look at these, these images and these objects, they're they're dull, they're, they're flat, they're matte, they're, they're not at all celebratory. I mean, the last work I saw was the work you did um, with you and your sister um, at Acre. <laughs> and that work was very different. It had kind of you know, whimsical notes throughout it, whatever. You know, there was a kind of vibrancy to it. And this work is really, um, you know, it, it is very, you um, know, it feels like feels like violations on each of these things. You know? mm -hmm. You're doing these damaging things. And so when I look at this work and I think about the experience, I think about, you know, how different people go through death in different ways. And so I look at these and they're pretty they're pretty heavy for that reason. Yeah. You know, that they're not mournful, they're kind of angry in a way, I think. Yeah, know? they're angry and I see a lot of violence in the work actually. in a lot of it. I mean there's a Obscurity, obfuscation comes out like very obviously in a lot of them, um, and angry definitely comes out. I think that this video comes across to me as very angry. It's the one that has a very direct glare, um, where you're looking directly at the at the camera, and and um, it's a very intense experience um, seeing this video. And I came back and saw it yesterday to see it alone is even more intense than at the opening the first time I saw it, which you can't experience. It. Yeah. It, it's a really intense experience. And um, someone described the show to me as visceral, which is an overused term, but it actually is exactly right for this show, I think. Speaking about viscera, sort of, there's a lot of like references to body fluid, <coughs> things that could be seen as body fluid, like mm -hmm. blood and bile and all that stuff happens within illness and death. I think it's apparent. You you get really up close and intimate with those things, and, and to see that comes from the work is uh, yeah, it's hard, um, but I, I think it's it's important and it's revelatory. For you. I I obviously have a different relationship with that <coughs> than than you all. But that was definitely not sort of 
my uh, my takeaway, I have to say, um, not that I necessarily disagree with, I think, some of, of the more, and sort of just in general terms, like, you know, uh, you know, maybe like little adjectives here, like, you know, angry, repulsive, like certain things, it's like, yeah, but I, I was not thinking about that yeah. when I went through this show. I was not thinking even about illness, you know, it's, uh, I mean, what, is I, the tone, what is the tone of the work to you, regardless of whether you were thinking about specific things? When you look at the show as a whole, what do you feel, do you feel as if there's a tone to the work? There's, there's a very definite tone, and again, like I said, like, uh, this one is not one that I've, like, figured out yet for myself, I don't have a little, like uh, pitch to myself, like oh this, one. but um, it was it was also very pleasurable in a way, you know, in a way that's not in a in a weird way it was less fun than the work you did with your sister at at the uh, photo fest, mm -hmm. but more pleasurable, like more deeply pleasurable. Like there were some things here that. I wanted to see that I didn't know that I wanted to see. Like specifically like the you know the nail clippings on there. I, I didn't know that I wanted to see that until I saw it. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a part of me that really was just was just dying to see that. And and now that I have it, I'm, I'm thankful, you know. So it is it's it's a weird little thing. I mean, I know I knew, I had an idea, I didn't know, I had an idea of the stuff you were going through around the time that the work was made, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously that's going to bleed into the work in a way, but since we didn't talk about it, yeah. I didn't want to make any assumptions. Um, I so, agree that it's pleasurable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just more, not more, it's just very complex. Mm -hmm. But, but. So I, I always try to keep like the bio like away. Separate, yeah. Yes, just because uh, I don't know. It, it's it's sort of I don't want to say complicated. So it's complicated. It always sounds like something you want. It it dilutes a lot of work for me. Mm -hmm. You know when you know the bio is at the forefront of my thoughts. So like I'm not even dealing with not just Peacock's bio, I'm not even dealing with Peacock as much as possible. You can't do that, man. You, you know, know her. It's still, <laughs> I, 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 I try real hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, I'm not 100% successful, but it's, uh, it's more better for me. It's more better for me uh, for work, you know, because, I mean, if I was only concerned about the work of people I like, and if I rejected all the assholes' work, you know, it's, my like little personal like slideshow of good art would be but you but you didn't know sort of mm -hmm. the, the circumstances mm -hmm. under which the work is made so you can't really separate it right as much as possible it's an effort okay. but it, it, it's definitely something that's like i have to keep telling myself you know it's <laughs> because especially since that's not something i've gone through and that's something that honestly uh because my parents are so far away right now that if something like that happened, like it freaks me out. Like it freaks me out a lot. Because it's like I have no access to it. So I try not to think about that. You know, so part of it is just the you know wrong person baggage is like you, you know, I mean I, I I can't make those assumptions because that's not something that I can even think about in my own life, let alone like live through. So yeah, I mean maybe in this case it was actually easier than usual to separate like the events and the bio from the work. I mean, I tried to do some of that because I came into the show, um, you know, knowing full well and being really predisposed to just like revel or like wallow in that kind of thing as I've done my whole miserable life. And so I come in here and it's like, you know, I know everything. And so I have tried, I think, as you said, to do some kind of like phenomenological activity where I ask myself, how are these objects really working? I think that you're right, you don't need to know the particular circumstances in this work, of this work, to see that 
there is like a defacing kind of action. There is kind of a, you know, there is an aggression to this work. It's not work that is um, sort of positive or trying to like help you through the show or, you know, soothe you through with color and composition. I mean, things are very, things are very harsh. And so, you know, even not knowing that it's about death, I think that that's enough for this exhibition. And I think that it's really hard for, I think it's harder than we, than we let on for an artist to create an exhibition that has a really strong, I use the word tone all the time, but I think it's really hard to get like a unified sort of sense of a tone throughout an exhibition. And I think that when one does just that, at least, that it's really successful. Most of the time I look at work and it's like, there's just this sort of random cacophony. <laughs> but I come in here and the work is very, very focused. And even though each Im image is very different, I do have sort of a unified feeling when I come to the work, you know, when I step into the exhibition space. I think I didn't, I was aware of Emily, of your mother's passing, but I actually did not know before I came into this show that this work was sort of made at all in response for during that period. So I came into it out of ignorance at a place where Sebastian wanted to be. Um, and I have not lost my parents, but I did, I did have a loss of a close family member last year, and so maybe I'm predisposed towards it as well. Um, because I think it, it was, I got it very, it was very apparent to me that it had something to do with illness or death. And it, you know, it didn't even strike me about it being about someone as close as a parent. I just saw it as about loss. And there was a, a sort of profound sadness to some of it. Um, dealing, I mean, I haven't dealt with, with it in the way that you and Michael have, obviously, or are dealing with it. Um, but there, I dealt with an uncle who had a, a, a year and a half of dying of cancer, and it was ugly. And it was close to me for a short period of time. and then close to my mother for a longer period of time, and I, so I was experiencing it, it mediated through her. Um, but it is, it's ugly. Uh, an illness and a death like that is, is profoundly ugly, and, and that's what I got in a lot of this. I think I, I felt that. I think it was afterwards thinking about the work that I think I started making connection to your mother. So, Maybe Sebastian is what I'm saying, is I think in a very long-winded way, is that perhaps three of the panelists here are predisposed to see some of that. Does it matter? Like, as, as a viewer coming into the space, you're talking about whether it matters um, hanging on to like a bio or do you know it in advance, but isn't maybe the point to have a show, isn't the point to have a show that stands beyond like the, the story that goes into making the work, and it, isn't it more important that it works conceptually? And, and maybe a second part of that is, um, based on what y'all were just talking about, like loss and, 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 and you know, that personal experience, does not that moment like have you clinging to the object? And isn't maybe a photograph like the, the seminal object that one clings to in that moment of loss? Okay, so the first half of it was <laughs> the first half of the thing was. Like, is it that shouldn't it stand is, is, apart? Isn't is it that important that um, you know the story coming in as a viewer in general, whether you know the person or not, or is it more important that it stands alone conceptually? Um, Good work should should always stand alone, okay? but it always comes out of something. But. I, I mean, I think that's what's when I say tone. Well, I, think I, that's I guess because what, what you're saying there is like all work should stand alone, of course, and all work comes from somewhere, yes, but does it get a pass because like this situation is more difficult than like a more uplifting situation or a, a more uplifting source material? No, I feel like when I came into the show, I'm, I came into it with more expectation of you than, than I would any other show, you know, any other kind of thing, because I think that for an artist to put work on the wall that's about, A, just about death, right? But B, about the death of a really close loved one, and then someone who's in, in your process too, right? I think that you have, I think artists have a huge responsibility 
like, so when I come into the show, it's like the biography doesn't prompt me to want to give a pass to it. It makes me more discriminating. And I want to see if there are, I want to see if there's any bullshit in the way that it's, in the way that it's been dealt with, you know? And, um, and it, there's not. I think that the notion of a pass, I mean, I don't think it's about a pass or not, but I want to I want to see how art articulate the artist can be with with an issue. Um, and maybe it's an issue that I'm aware of, maybe it's part of a biography that I'm aware of, and maybe it's not. But I think I, I personally judge work by how articulate it is, how good it is at conveying <coughs> something, um, a message. That, that's my approach towards work, but it should be about conveying something, some emotion, some feeling, some something. I mean, yeah, it's uh, maybe personally I won't use the word message. I, I love artists, obviously, you know. Uh, I love having dinner with them and uh, <laughs> hanging out and going to shows with them and, and talking to them. Uh, but I don't you need you to end the room with me when I went to work. You know, that's like the last thing I need. Um, because, again, you, you, that's just not the work. And, and it's not necessarily a question of the message. It's, it's a question of whether I'm, I'm changed or not. You know, um, But it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is true. We all know when we approach something that has an impact on us. Yeah. I mean, we all know it. You know? I mean, different things impact different people. But you know when you walk up to an object and you're like, whatever. You know? I mean, you have to A, be open minded, not just like shut things down immediately. But mm -hmm. I think we all know that feeling of coming up to an object, looking at it, dealing with it, <coughs> and thinking, like, you know, this, this has nothing for me. Right. You know, this has nothing for me. You know, different work, different people, different kinds of things. But we all know that feeling, right? We come up to someone and we're like, whatever. You know, this is this is not strong. And you know, I don't think anything here gives you that. It gives me that sense. You know, yeah. formally, like there are just some really kind of amazing little things. I mean, the baby one with the teeth is just. I mean, it's just an incredible image, and I think things that go into it that make it so are the fact that some of the teeth are green and. The fact that it's on aluminum and it is on the wall, you know, it's just a really incredible image. But then there are some <coughs> sort of whimsical things that are just like the the fingernails or toenails or whatever on the food. I think the thing that makes that photograph so interesting to me is those little colors. <coughs> they they look like onions or they look mm. like something else on top of it. It looks like it's part of the food at first, and <laughs> there are just little complex moments in all the photographs where those things kind of work all together and you know you look at it at first and it looks like food and you come up to it and you start to parse the image and that's what is good about them is you have to dissect them a bit you know you can't get them in one if you get it in one look and you walk past it you haven't really seen the image like why are those kids playing in peas <laughs> <laughs> Because when you grow up and pour off there, you only have green balls. <laughs> 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 Emily, I was going to ask all of you guys what it is, when I look at every work and see even the little things, what is it that you I'm not a photographer at all, and when I try to take photos, I feel like I don't have the sense that maybe you guys do that have been with that device for as long as you have. What is it about that gaze, I guess, through that lens that has affected the show and a difference between maybe if you're a versus a painter, and of course, Michael, you can answer this from your side, being not primarily a photographer dealing with photographs but not looking through that lens. You know, there's this, I don't want to say one point perspective because they're not that technically, but there's this, this like kind of <coughs> that you get through a lot of these, like it's narrow in a way. Like uh, it's not, when I look at the work, they're not, there's not like a ton of depth. You know, like if I was a, like a landscape painter, you know, I want all that stuff in the foreground and the background, I'm reaching for it. Like I, that's a different way of looking. And I wanted to hear all of you guys what it, what you as a photographer bring to your work that has to deal specifically with photography as a medium. Oh. Are they cropped? No. 
So the image I see is the image of the photo? Yeah. <coughs> to, to me, it kind of breaks down to like how we do. Like, Michael makes stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we hit stuff. Okay? Hey, I'll, that, that's that's my young problem. And some people disagree with me. Yeah. <laughs> that are way like, you know, as neck deep in photography than I am, but it's all we do. We're thieves. Yeah. We take stuff. And you know, you're all like, ah, oh, come on. Come on. We love thieves. We love yeah. Robin Hood and stuff. You know? <laughs> but it's 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 the elegance. It's like the difference between some gross, like Enron person. Not that kind of thief. Talking about like us and you think, you know what I'm saying? Like you steal a building brick by brick without like, you know, like the French authorities never being wise to what you're doing. That kind of, that's, that's, that's some good stuff. You know, we take. And uh, you know, Jean Mo was very, very clear about this in uh, Another Way of Telling, which is my favorite book about photography. And one of the things, like, we kind of have like a, a sort of like low self-esteem thing. I mean, that's why we keep reading stuff about people that hate photography, like bugs and you know, <laughs> painting. Like, it's like those people never like photography, and that's what we read in school, you know? Uh, painters don't do that. Did, did it force you to read something about somebody who hated paintings and didn't trust paintings? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, talking about photography that way is just crazy. I mean, photography is the has been the only game in our visual world since, like, since Vermeer. I mean, and yet people, you know, people hate it. And you know, you know, you know, I mean, but I think we are a self-hating bunch. Well, self I, think I, that well, I refuse, refuse it. it. I embrace the theory. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know? That, I think it is. A, I've, I've talked to. I mean, there are students oh, in this, but I've talked to. You, spent a lot of time talking against consumptive language with photography. I think that um, that. Using consumptive language rather than productive language it contributes to the ghettoization of the medium and of our art form, which I think that you know I think people. Right. I think people do that to us already, and as a defensive uh, mechanism, a lot of photographers take that on. And when they say things like, "Oh, well, I got into photography because I couldn't," you know, I can't draw very well, but I got into photography. I draw. There's still plenty of people. Say that. <laughs> 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 and and the, the point is that it shouldn't matter whether you can draw or not. That's not why you picked up the camera. And I think that that, that those who say that sort of stuff, who talk about taking, and I've not heard someone so articulately talk about taking in such a, in a way as you have. So but I, I, talk, I talk about it grossly when you compare it to like John Berger and Jean Maul, who actually love photography and are quite literate. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like those schools were built by painters, and they're like, Somebody will figure out how to teach your photographers. And well, I think I'm, it, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think the reason why I love photography so much is because it's so like democratic, like it, and since like the beginning of its invention, it's like allowing people. Before, it's like a portrait in your home was painted, and who had painted portraits in their home was the only people who were like super wealthy. And so I liked that photography sort of freed up people to be able to have their picture taken and their portrait taken. Buying, you know, and pay a little for it. And then also then in the like 50s, the brownie being like something that anyone could, like you didn't have to go to a professional studio. You could now just take, you could have your own camera and get your film process, then they send you back your prints. Like I love that about photography. And all that is, um, all this thing about photography and like its validity or, or lack of validity, that's all just like painters pissed off because mm -hmm. for years like they had this market monopoly on giving us representations of ourselves, right? And they used photographic methods for all of that time. They kept that shit all secret. It's like, no, 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 only we can like make these images of ourselves. And then at some point, you know, this little magic really? moment in history. Yes, yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. totally. The, the painters are fine, I think. I married a painter. You know, that's like I divorced a painter. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think who's really really afraid, and that's that's the weird part to me, is writers. You know, writers are afraid of photography in a way that's really sort of like weird and off-putting. You know, because because they think of photography as sort of like covering the same territory as they do. Yeah. I think it has something to do with photography being like black and white for so long. 
you know, like literally, like, you know, you didn't have access to color, you know. Um, so it seems like, it seemed like Sparrow Fuel was playing the same game. Like, for example, we have, we don't have, you know, painting journalism or printmaker journalism, but we have photojournalists, which is not true. There's no such thing as photojournalists that never existed, you know, but like, writers are like, oh, that's my territory. Photo essays, photojournalism. It was like, what's that? It's like, come into my house? You know, and it becomes like weirdly territorial. And of course, since the writers are the ones that actually write the stuff and the message is clear because we all understand the 26 letters of the alphabet, but what the hell does like a picture of a broken down car mean? You know, it's kind of a lopsided fight. Not that we're fighting it, really, but we're in it. Yeah. You know, we've been in it. It's, it's, it's a medium under attack. And it's even a medium under attack for reasons that have to do with, um, look, like, so you mentioned, like, photography, and you mentioned also, like, a sort of, like, access to memories and emotions, and all, all, almost as this sort of, like, talisman, I guess. But photography these days, you know, because it's information, you know, and information, you gotta control that, you know, in this current state, that's like money. That's one of the things I really responded to about your work was that it wasn't about information at all, you know, for me. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't delivering information in that sense. It was, it was more, but it was more than just objects. You can see them like wanting to burst beyond sort of like the object that exists in an album. And let's face it, those albums are covered in dust, you know, for yeah. most people. Right. Not yours. <laughs> That's what I said for most people. I know not yours. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is more like, yeah, this is, this is more like having like, a little statuette in your home that you depend on, you know, for your daily rituals. There's something about that to these objects. There's something about the, like, forget information, you know, forget the real. You know, I took these things and I made them thus, you know, and, and now you can go for it. And, you're, and, and if you're lucky enough to, to be a red daughter, you know, you have to <laughs> like, you have like something really active and powerful in your house now that you can use, that you can use to I'm really sounding bullshitty now, but oh well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I'm probably into it. It's like that you can use to, to to channel things, you know, to invoke things. It's not yeah, it it doesn't tell you stuff, it gives you access to stuff. Yes. I have a, a question. So well, I think what I'm more interested in is less the sort of perspective of a photographer. I'd like to hear from artists and photographers, but really all of us are, have now relationships with photography. And you guys even touched on that different generations have different relationships with photography, more or less of it, different ways that it's been framed or in your family or life. Uh, and I would see as an extension of still photography and snapshots and portraits and things, also films and videos, home movies, all of that, all of this kind of thing that's sort of between uh, personal memory this and, and let's say art, this kind of um, sort of mediator, capturer of moments and things that we, all of us, artists or not, have relationships with now. And now more than ever, right, with like everything from Instagram to like, pornography to like cell phones, everything is like this capturer and sender and distributor of things. I, I'm just curious what, how that, um, how that relationship plays in, I guess, maybe all of our thinking, but also in your various creative processes that the, what's interesting to me, I think about this work is that, the, that I don't see this stuff first as photographs, even though they are all photographic media. But I see them more as dealing with relationships with photographic images, more so than photographs themselves. You know, so I kind of wonder, I mean, you do draw a lot of your drawings from. I mean, I think when we get up in the morning, when we open our eyes, what we see is informed by photography. I mean, I think that 
organically as people we are trained to see photographically like I can't imagine <clears throat> I mean I know for like myself I've had like lots of vision problems right like issues with lost vision that kind of thing so I understand how kind of um, how the world expands or contracts or you see things differently you can't see something over here if you have a certain kind of damage you see everything in front of you I think that probably most people for a long, long time, like long before we were born, see the world photographically. I can't imagine how, I mean, not every single day, not in a completely literal way, but the way we look at the world is informed from start to finish by photography, I think. And I can't really put myself in the position of someone who, like, got up in the morning, walked outside before photography, you know, before we had this notion of, like, what it means to frame something, you know? Sometimes I look at things outside and you like adjust your vision, you know? You frame things all the time, you know? You're always framing things. And so I think that that's just really pretty profound. And, you know, your question about how does that affect your everyday, I think it affects I think, everything, for, for me at least. And I assume probably for most people. I mean, it's just so ubiquitous, you know? And it's funny that there's this sort of talk about ghettoization of photography and all that stuff and I think that like our lives are just saturated in photography so much so that we can't even disengage ourselves from it you know I mean that's what I suspect no I think I think you're right I think it is that way it is it is everywhere it is in everything you do and I, I would even venture to say that increasingly uh, we can see our, our world cinematically um, with an offshoot of it an evolution of the um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, to, if I can go back to to your question, Peter, um, you know, I, I think that 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 indexing of, of images and that sort of consumption and uh, production of images and so much and and the taking in of them, I think, plays into a lot of. I'm going to go back to the consumption versus conduct uh, <coughs> consumptive language rather than productive language. That notion of just collecting images taking images, putting them someplace, storing them here, as opposed to, to making them in a considered place. Sebastian makes very considered photographs. So it, I think it's strange when you talk about taking them. I think he makes very considered <laughs> photographs. They're nicely framed so they don't look like you frame. I mean, I've, I've seen him photograph, and I know, I know that it looks a whole lot more like making rather than taking. And, you know, it, 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 Part of it is related to uh, like hunting. A lot of the language around photography is related to hunting, including you know the most common <coughs> snapshot was a hunting term long before it was a photographic term. Um, you know that and using shooting, which we use often. I think that it's I think that it's it's a violent language. These are and nothing I mean, like that. These these are nothing like. I mean, really, they're nothing like. They're, not. they're like they're like a drawing or a painting. Right. I, I think mean, that you know these two, which. I keep coming back to these photographs of, of your father, Emily, because they stand for me outside of all of the other work in here. Um, we talked about how a lot of these other images are about like obscuring things, right? Like that turkey stops being a turkey, it's something else with the clipping on it. Um, but these, this piece here is really about clarity, in fact. You start with an obscured image and then you find clarity, and the second image, the one on the the right um, is a really potent image. It's a very strong image. Um, you know, it, it conveys so much more, and it stands out so dramatically from the rest of the work in, in the show. Not just because it's framed, not just because of the size, but because I think it actually works. It seems to me to work in reverse of all the other stuff. Are these two different shots, or is it the yes. same shot? No, they're two, two different, different shots. Mm -hmm. I think it helps explain the other work. It helps explain the other work. Hmm. It's interesting you said it works in reverse. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. I mean, that's, you know, following the thing of reading left to right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you mean it explains the other Because it's a, well, to me, it's, you read it left to right, I read it both ways. <coughs> Not that one is a truth and one yeah, is a fiction. And so it, it helps to, having it 
sort of the truth and the fiction separated like that helps explain a lot of the things that are going on in the other world. That both these both these realities exist at the same time. Right. And so in, in a lot of the other works they're sort of compressed. Eh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I think the thing that's interesting is we're talking, as far as I can tell, only about the photographs and really mostly about the ones on aluminum, but mm -hmm. there are video works, there's something that's <coughs> sculptural here. I wonder if you could maybe like tell me or us a little bit about this one. Like where did the seed come from? What's the deal with it? Yeah, so it came from, I guess, two, two separate places. Um, the first place is I was in the car constantly driving um, sometimes two to three times a week uh, to see my mother. And so I was in the car a lot and driving down the highway really late at night. Uh, this Escalade who had se several screens in their car, which no one really has those screens anymore because you have an iPad and a phone that, that, that play video. But so he had all of his screens playing porn and he was the only person in the vehicle. So he was playing <laughs> it for the people driving by him. So I hung out with them for a little while and then uh, made my way. But I just thought it was interesting and sort of thinking about like photography. It was like, it's almost like this archaic way of, of showing video in a car because now everything's on an iPad. But, so like technology. And then thinking about the ice bucket challenge of um, <laughs> people you know, posting all these videos and that being like super popular to raise money. Um, I was like, what can I do that could be like really absurd to raise money? Um, and I had a bottle of iodine because I was doing, you know, I did several other things with the iodine on photographs and stuff like that. And um, Why the iodine? It was just something that my, we used on my mother and so it was like I had like I would take things from the hospital and from I would go to a medical supply store and just like take things from hospice as well. So just collecting these items. So um, and also just I think the color of it too. Anyway, so it was just like this absurd thing of um, doing a money shot with the iodine. <laughs> Anyways, but I think there's something sort of people um, have been responding to it, you know. I think it is this really sort of absurd, kind of funny thing, and people seem to be responding to it differently. But I was talking with Peter about it the other day, and it's, it's sort of interesting with like the gays and what, like women in art posing nude, and also, but I'm the also the the maker of it as well. Um, so I think there's a little bit of like a feminist uh, tone to it. It is profoundly yeah. unsexy. <laughs> you, but but you, I'm, I'm glad that you say it was funny because when we came in and, and obviously I was a little bit like outside of like the sort of I think effective consensus here because uh, I thought that was funny and one of this because like you took the that because you know I've seen them and I experienced them and, and like in the ways that you talk about. Nobody's ever watching, you know. On the screens? Yeah, it was, it was never about watching, you know. It was just about like It was just that. about having it. Yeah. And, and there's something like deeply, on like every level, on like several different levels, that this is like an up approach here. Because it's like, it put in a gallery, you know, where all we do is like, you know, give, ourselves over to these objects and give them our attention, you know, but also its presence here just like floating by itself without the rest of whatever sort of like pent out slab you got it from, you know, <laughs> and yeah, I, I didn't necessarily read that as a money shop, but there was something a little bit, I don't know, like I, I think the note mentioned anger. I. I did not get angry out of it. If anything, it was, maybe it's funny in the way that like Takashi Miike is funny sometimes, even though people are getting, getting like ripped to shreds. You know? No, I think it is. I think it is humorous in that way, and I think that kind of stuff, um, BK, this, um, those kinds of humorous, violent things. I think that those are um, 
you know, I think that's part of the show. I think that going through, you know, I know going through a death and stuff, it's like, part of it is just so macabre and like, quite funny and just, you don't even know what to do with it. And that's kind of what I get. That's yeah. the sense I get from this video. Is there's like a lot of like, impotence in the figure, you know, it's a little over exaggerated. The the sculptures to me seem very different. <clears throat> um, very different than the rest of the work, particularly the one that was in the middle of the gallery that isn't here now because of the chairs. Um, can have you made sculptures before or is this the first time you've done something sculptural? Yeah, space? it's the first time. What did you think of the sculpture? I thought, I, mean, I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. I mean, I, right, I'm, I'm, this is an ongoing discussion between Sebastian and Julie and myself. I really want to, because of the nature of my job, I've been trained to explain something away and mm -hmm. try to explain it in a way that I can explain it to other people. Um, so I kept wanting to find, and I'm looking for, I was looking for a narrative. I came in here looking for a narrative in your work. Um, so I, I saw that really as an autobiography in a lot of ways. I, you know, partly because of the coins, with all dated to 1984, your birth year. Um, I, I thought it was, it was interesting. It was intriguing. There was a, some mystery to it uh, as well. I was really intrigued by the color red. I'm intrigued by the, your use of red all over the show. Okay. Red pops up again and again and again as a reoccurring mo motif. Um, yeah, I, I honestly didn't want to touch it. I talked about wanting to touch the photograph, mm -hmm. but I'm actually maybe too, too trained from being in an institutional setting not to touch the artwork. Um, You've got to get out of there. This is a great, I know, I do. <laughs> but to, to touch it was a, was a really wonderful experience. Right? Yeah. Um, and then I really didn't want to stop touching it. I opened up all the drawers and looked for it. And if I'm reading it as an autobiography, then that, that takes it to a really dark place, that the drawers are empty. Mm -hmm. um, but those are my thoughts on that. That's a super interesting point, I think, that you want <coughs> to touch the photographs and you don't want to touch the sculpture. Maybe you could expound on that? I have a weird relationship with photographs and objects. I mean, that we started talking about it. Like, I have a really... I have a real distaste for, for uh, the photographic print. They really bug me. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an issue between like Jennifer and I. Jennifer, has, she loves photographs, she loves prints, she loves paper, she loves to smell them. I, I swear <laughs> I caught her licking old photographs. <laughs> it has this attachment to fixer or something like that. But, um, I really, I'm perfectly happy Experiencing photographs on a screen, I really, I, I'm happy. I look at, I look at most of the photographs I look at are on the screen. I experience it, them there, so I, I don't actually like to touch photographs that much. It's I think. Backlit, it's backlit. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> vibrant. It's a, it adds something to it. And, you know, you're able to sort of explore it in a way um, that you're not able to in person. So, yeah, I don't know. It's my own. It's my own pathology. I think. Probably. Uh, you know, I think it says something about this show that, you know, it's it works as a show for me because I'm I'm not, I'm not like to know like Prince is like whatever yeah. it's it's a I don't know it's a concession to to, to the market it's like photographs for me like unlike you you say screen I say book it's like it's a book medium. Even in books, you know. When I go to the MFA, it's like, you have nice friends. Yeah, whatever. You have to urge library. Let me go look at some books. You know what I'm saying? You. Oh, and stuff is like. Oh, photographers, man. That's yeah. weird. Books. I don't have no, a like books. Books. Photographers love books. Love books. Love books. Yeah. Photographers are, are the this reason is. that our books continue to be popular. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you look at the masters, and you look at the living masters. They are book people that make prints occasionally. You know, you look at John Gossage, he's book people. You look at Robert Adams, he's book people. But you're talking about artists. The, the images that are used in the show are, are snapshots. It's a different... Nate Lyon, you What's know... Uh, sorry, no, not Nate Lyons. Nate Lyons, I don't use that. Why do I, I don't always lose this? Is it a... Danny? Danny, thank you. 
Danny Lyon. He uses snapshots in his book work sometimes. He says, like, you know, just like um, a, you know, William Ellis Burroughs, if somebody wrote a better paragraph than me and is saying what I'm trying to say, I'm just going to take that paragraph. And, you know, Dan Lamb does the same thing in his books. Well, I guess what I'm talking about is, like, the family photographs that you have, there's, like, a box of them, right? Or there's oh, an albums. album, and you spread which, them out. Which is a book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a book. Oh, wow. oh, wow. <laughs> it's a book. 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 <laughs> it's a book. You know? You go, you go to... It's a different thing. It's a book. You go see... Uh, yeah, you're looking at, it's just a container, actually. I mean, a book is entirely... In the, Anybody who's ever done a book understands that, that there's a lot of other considerations right. that go into it. You have to sequence in the way images relate and the inherent narrative to it. Albums, and maybe in the way that you're using snapshots, Michael, um, which is as a resource, then at that point the album is just a container for... But they were the first books. I agree. <laughs> they were the first photo books. I you know, all agree. books are descended, you know, from, from the photo albums like Lit It Like Status and... You know, you take it out and pass it around your, to the family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, and, and they're highly, highly, you know, it's like it's certainly a lot more curated and sequenced than say like Philip Roca de Porsche's One Thousand or something. You know, it's like super. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. It's yeah. a book. There's a within the, the photo album. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of thought in the photo. It's not, it's not just chronological? Yeah, no. Not, not most of the ones, you know, especially <laughs> if, if they've been made by some retired grandma <laughs> with like a lot of time. You're like, okay, now I can find you to do this. You know? but, but, you know, there's, it can be chronological and still have a lot of editing. Yeah. So, yeah. Because there is, the whole process of editing is, a, yeah, I mean, my grandmother had, she was a, a you know, she was a, a really serious amateur photographer. And she photographed a lot on her travels. So she had a lot of albums that were very, very carefully cataloged. She had her China trip book one, her China trip book two. I mean, she had it all down, and it was all chronological, right? Um, but there would be plenty of things. Like she'd have the stuff, like it was those magnetic ones. You know, you pull back the sheet, and there was that thing of glue strips, and you put it on there, you never got it off again. She'd have those, but then there would always be like the outtakes that she wasn't really sure if she wanted to put it in there. They were always sort of slipped in there. Um, so that editing process, I think, for a lot of people, again, maybe this is a generational thing, was really important. Yeah. And the photographs, that, the albums that she had of my, of my father as a child are even more tightly edited. And that was a time when you know, she was using photo corners in a, a plain paper book, and they were annotated. She was very careful to put who was in all the photographs on the page. I mean, it is something. And you see that, I think, with even new parents. I'm seeing this with like my friends. The first child has really great photographs. And they're all like cataloged really well. The second child gets screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can interject about the editing of the photo book editing, like a lot of people are like, especially young people, but even I'm doing that online or Instagram or whatever, with your camera, you like take all these photographs and you're mm -hmm. like, nope, nope, mm -hmm. yes, no. Nope. Like we're actually doing that way more mm -hmm. kind of what our mothers and grandmothers, all, all, all families were doing with photo albums. Yeah. But like at the moment and with high speed and with a lot more, we're actually kind of choosing what. But isn't photography a medium of editing? Like you're editing, editing the world around you. Yeah, and yeah you, you, the yeah. you take these shots and you, you maybe print some of those and then of those prints, you end up ordering them in a photo album, and some of them get left out, or some of them end up in frames and hung up. And like, isn't that just inherent to the nature of? And and I'll, I mean, just because I have the stage again. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask uh, about um, something else. <laughs> I mean, that's something that's changed while you're thinking about that, John. Um, how things have changed in the era of film, you, you know, you never got a chance to look at it. So yes, you dropped off your roll of film, you got the whole roll processed, and then you stood over the garbage can, sorting through them. People throw them Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that's the ones that were banned. No. That's because you didn't have books. books. <laughs> you didn't have books, you have boxes. Well, that's something I really liked about something you mentioned once, Emily, that you were talking about what you were saying I could get to a role. 
And you would see like embarrassing photos of your friends, and they couldn't just be like, no, no, give me that. I'm gonna delete it. Oh yeah, it. delete it. You know, yeah. I really like that connotation of understanding that that might not happen anymore mm -hmm. in the same way that you see it. Bad photo. The existence yeah, of bad existence photographs. Of, of bad or, or incriminating. Yeah, like that photograph way. might, that original photograph might have been deleted immediately because it wasn't centered yeah. enough. For right, me. right. For either for aesthetic reasons, which is hilarious. Yeah. Or for, you know, oh, well, my child looks horrible Weird. in this yeah. photo. She looks like she's sick or something. Yeah. There are great things I miss not having. I mean, we used to pull really great Christmas pranks when people left cameras in the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't want to leave that Oh. I do. Those are easily discovered. Yeah. Okay. It's not the slow burn. <laughs> Knowing that, that when they're going to go home and back. get a quick, quick, quick picture oh. of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I seem to remember when we were in school at some point, I, I want to say it was you, but maybe it wasn't you. Somebody was changing people's ringtones. Especially people probably. people that weren't used to changing their ringtones yet. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like stuck with whatever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's a ring song? <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there any other questions or comments? What do you guys, it's really stupid, but what do y'all think about, you know those apps that are like, they change your face? And they like, face swap? Yeah, like, well not stupid. face swap, the ones that make it look better. Like um, how that's kind of this weird continuation of glamour shots. One touch Photoshop, is that what that is? Sort of, it's like this app that you use do you know what I'm talking about? It's just automatic on a lot of cameras. It, yeah, it's like automatic, <laughs> it like makes you look better. Like if all these like... What do you mean better? <laughs> Watch the tube for your face. How could I look better? It washes it, it, it out. It, it yeah, washes it washes it out. It takes it to the Yeah, it, yeah. It, it just yeah, it it really like makes your skin blurry looking so that it's like... Yeah, it's really great. It's Yeah, yeah. It's incredible. What people get paid hundreds of dollars to do, so... Yeah, yeah. But how it's like this instant kind of strange. Like I guess how photography in some of the really odd ways have influenced things like technology the way we use it now, and it's very instant. Like I'm a little better with this thing, or how, or all the other weird things that photography has influenced. I mean, just relating to that, I think. I mean, the way you take photographs, what you choose to do with the photographs, just says everything about your cultural moment in time. You know, so if. You take a photograph with your phone, and the whole thing is that it washes you out and, and you know, bleaches you out and corrects you. I mean, I think that says something in a general sense about your culture at that moment and how we as humans are choosing to represent ourselves. I think that at the heart of it, that's really the thing about all visual art is everything you look at is a choice in how we choose as people to represent ourselves. You know? And I think that there are certainly like trivial ways of doing it. I think that that, I mean, in my opinion, it's a trivial, stupid thing to do. I mean, it has nothing to do with, uh, I don't want to say reality because nothing really is real, but, but it has nothing to do with, with anything meaningful. I think that being a wash in this, this like glut of imagery that we're in, I think artists, again, have a, like a responsibility to create images that are meaningful, you know, or have something, and you know, just to say what that is, it's different in all kinds of circumstances, but I think that as artists making images, as photographers, or, you know, people like me who work from photographs, I think that there's a big responsibility on us to make meaningful images and not to just reproduce all of the bullshit that we see every day, you know, and I think that these are responsible images. I know that sounds like, well, responsible images, you know. But I think that these are responsible, you know? And I don't mean that in some kind of like parent sort of way. They're, they're careful, <laughs> they're articulated, and you know, they're not fast, and they're not throwaway. And I think that's, I mean, for me, that's the first thing I ask with any image I see is how, how much do I think this artist is taking responsibility for image making now in the 21st century? A lot of stuff I look at, it's just like, yeah. no, no responsibilities no. taken whatsoever, you know? Even in the art context. I'll just say, okay, I have two things for all of this. One thing I've been waiting for y'all to say, because <clears throat> you were saying painting and photography, the first thing I thought of was collage, which is different 
because you're, it's kind of like between painting and photography because you're arranging and editing, but you, you don't have the commitment that you have with painting. So like these are pretty much like the same as, I mean, Romare Bearden's collages, he presented them as photographs. They weren't collages, they were photographs <coughs> of collages. And I just got like, oh, she's messing around with stuff on top of stuff, like until it looks cool and you know, until it looks seductive. That's what I got, and I think collage is very different than, I mean, this is like a collage, this is a collage. This is. The other thing I was gonna say is, um, like you keep saying how we're all like surrounded by images, and just because we're surrounded does not mean people are really seeing them. You know what I'm saying? Because no, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> I think that's the artist's job, is to teach people to look and to see things. Um, Sounds kind of condescending, though. But no, I no, I mean, no. But, I mean, I mean like, I mean, not in a way that they like, don't let know. Let me show you how to look at shit. Yeah. Well, no, the art, experts. Art, I mean, yeah. 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 Obviously, you're a freaking expert. Like, um, Who else is going to show them? Yeah. <laughs> when you listen to music, you hear the world differently. When you look at art, you see the world differently. And it show, it's like when you read a book, you think about the world differently. And so, just because, like, a rap, you know, your average person who maybe doesn't look at art or make art, yeah, there's images all around them, but they're not looking at them, and they're not seeing them, you know, the way we see them. We take that for granted because we're like, ah, images are powerful to us because that's what we do. But they're not seeing them. They're there, but they're not seeing it. I think the you know? same thing happens to me, you know, like, scrolling through Instagram, which I'm obsessive, compulsive <laughs> user of, and it's it's all bullshit, right? Well, then, yeah, and so, and I'm, I'm, str I'm streaming down through the feed, right? I'm looking at something, I get like, oh, I get enough information to say, oh, this is a room, and there's a table in it, and then I scroll right by, and I don't miss the fact that there's a cup on the table in the back, and there's a cat in the corner, and there's a light up there. So I think you're right. I think people do see them. I think they're looking at the surface of things. You gotta slow not your scroll. Into the image. <laughs> slow your scroll. You gotta slow your scroll. Slow the scroll. Slow that's, right. that's right. But I think in general, that's what people do. They look at the. They look at something long enough to get a general impression. They get a label. Of what they're like, oh, person, right. cat, sexy Dog. lady, this. But they don't really. It doesn't work on them because. You know, they, they, it, art, art has to show them how to do that. Well, and that's the question. I don't know, you know, I'm talking, you're not, you're, you're not spending enough time on Upworthy watching those videos <laughs> about the negative lessons that women are getting about body image uh, by, well, a, by a fashion photographs and, and magazines. So, I mean, yes and no, you're right, they're not, the average person who's not, right, this is a rather insular world that we're dealing yes. with here, right, this is a talk. A real talk, a wonderful real talk, <laughs> by a bunch of creative people for a bunch of creative people, right? Well, that, so but, this is real within our world. But, but that's even more reason to learn how to see because you can be manipulated right. into but, feeling But to baby. say that nobody sees the other images is, it's, that, I agree with you, it's, it's slightly common. Because if, they're, if oh, their self-esteem is lowered, they're not really looking. <laughs> they don't see they don't I, 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 what I don't disagree with my wife. You don't understand <laughs> it. It's different from not seeing it. No, no but that's the... No, no because, okay, no, it's, there's a difference oh. between looking and seeing. Oh, sorry. No, I, go ahead, go ahead. 